So I'm going to be talking about um, uh, sleep and nutrition. I will just go through disclosures quickly. Nothing's changed since last week. Uh, um, no uh, significant disclosures. Um, and uh, again, no additional funding. And I will use evidence base when possible. Um, and to mention when anything is my opinion or off, off label. Uh, if you click to the next slide there, Javid. Um, and just acknowledgement that uh, I work uh, as one of my medical psychiatry roles in obesity uh, and mental health as well. So I did consult with our uh, dietitians in our program who provided some excellent resources that I've included here um, and some useful tips and also bringing some of that clinical expertise, uh, hopefully to the nutrition part. All right, so we can go through these disclosures. I think I went through them verbally. All right, so I'm gonna talk about the importance of sleep and nutrition to mental health. I, I know that um, as things are changing in our current environment, we are definitely seeing a lot of different um, um, uh, changes that are happening day by day and today is no different. Um, so a lot of um, anxiety, worry, stress that might be um, uh, coming over many of us. And so as a result of that, uh, I think one of our base our things is important is in, it's important for us to focus on basic needs like uh, sleep and nutrition. I'll talk about an approach and some practical tips as well. All right, next slide. Thanks, Javid. So you've seen this slide, and if you click again, Javid, you'll just see that uh, I'm going to focus on insomnia again, common and related to distress, um, whether it was in SARS or in other pandemics, and I think an important piece for our self care. Uh, as we're in the midst of COVID-19. Next slide. And uh, just to show you that, um, you know, the previous was more of a, a cross-sectional approach, but this was an interesting study from SARS just looking at um, uh, in the same hospital in Taiwan, SARS units, the ICU and regular wards, um, and then a non-SARS units uh, and looking at nurses that um, during the acute phase when there were, you know, high volume of cases of SARS, um, obviously those who are caring for individuals uh, with SARS uh, in those units had higher rates of sleep disturbance or insomnia uh, compared to uh, non-SARS units. But over time, people adapted. And, and again, I think it just wants to highlight that we do have in the midst of um, acute stressors and and care needs that we do find ways to adapt. Um, but I, I think one of the things is, can we continue to scan and attend to our needs as those things are changing? And right now, as we're kind of in the early phases, it's a good time for us to take note about our sleep and nutrition. Next slide. And uh, this is something that, you know, uh, I've talked about in other echoes as part of clinical care, but also think about it in terms of my own kind of think assessment of insomnia, uh, we think about kind of predisposing factors, and I should include, that's not on the slide, physical health factors. Again, if people have, um, you know, pain um, or uh, other physical health issues that uh, might disrupt sleep, that's obviously an issue, but also mental health symptoms like anxiety, depression, uh, precipitating factors and their stressors, and that includes COVID-related care, uh, again, uh, thinking about uh, being, uh, you know, caring for patients and how we are managing our, our own safety while addressing those care needs that's a, that can be a source of stress. And then the other perpetuating factors, anything that might contribute to poor sleep hygiene, whether it's kind of work shifts, um, maybe the amount of coffee that we're uh, ingesting, ingesting um, maybe uh, additional stress uh, factors that may emerge over time. So I think these are all ways in which you just to think about as our sleep may be affected, what are some ways in which we can kind of take note of things we might be able to change or modify or adapt. All right, next slide. And, um, you know, following that, I think uh, we want to make sure that predisposing factors, again, are things that can increase our vulnerability to uh, acute insomnia and as these perpetuating factors may lead us to have more persistent long-term insomnia. All right, so then managing my insomnia. So just thinking about evidence-based approaches, this is what we would kind of do for insomnia, but 
are there parts of my health, my overall health that are affecting my sleep in a way that's disrupting it and taking note and kind of optimizing measures for that? In some of the mental health components or distress related, important to think about those strategies we briefly introduced and those we'll be talking about at subsequent sessions. Are we practicing good sleep hygiene? I know many of us have um, heard or counsel people on this, but uh, I have to say sometimes I need to take note of my own sleep hygiene because um, uh, it's uh, often difficult to practice what we preach. And so that's an important piece. And then relaxation. And again, we had Heather uh, leading us today, but uh, are there any kind of relaxation strategies? There's one there, progressive muscle relaxation, which is kind of tension relax relaxation of different muscle parts. That's an, a way of uh, another relaxation strategy. And then thinking about thoughts and feelings, picking up on Allison's presentation uh, last time of kind of feeling thoughts and behaviors as those might be uh, impacting our sleep, particularly long-term. Next slide. Um, and so here are principles of sleep hygiene. Uh, I would say one of the things that um, probably are related to our current time, um, regular sleep routine is often disrupted Many people are working atypical hours or maybe working it from home, which disrupts routines and schedules. Um, again, working from home, food may be um, uh, closer to the bed if we don't have space to work and we're working in our, in our bedroom becomes our work room. Um, that also impacts sleep environment. Um, also stimulants and, and I would say coffee and so, uh, you know, at, uh, if you're in a new setting or working different times, your caffeine intake may change as a result of that and kind of disruption. There are some things like hot bath showers before sleep or managing our exercise routine, which can be challenging as people are exercising later in the night to uh, promote physical distancing, that could be an issue. And one of the key things is again, not struggling in bed for long periods of time because it does condition us to think about uh, our bed as being awake and it can also lead to those uh, cognitions or thoughts that can be disruptive with our sleep pattern. All right, next slide. And so this is um, a component of cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, and you may be familiar with this, but I'll just review just things that we can do in our own self-care that having sleep routine, even when we're having kind of disrupted sleep, important to uh, wake up at the normal time that we would expect to wake, wake up, when, and again, when you have shift work, that, that can change dramatically, but trying to establish that routine, whether it's at home or in the workplace. Um, and again, if you're not getting good sleep, continuing to be persistent about that. Um, again, reducing the um, stimulus in our environment, right? Um, so again, if you're having trouble falling asleep, getting out of bed, um, not doing anything too stimulating, maybe uh, you know, reading something that's boring or something that's relaxing, and then as you're feeling tired, getting back to bed. There is cognitive therapy because those thoughts of, oh, I'm not gonna fall asleep, I'm not gonna get a good night's sleep, I'm gonna get more tired, and how am I gonna uh, function the next day uh, can be those repetitive thoughts. And again, thinking about recognizing them uh, and sometimes uh, testing those thoughts are, are quite helpful. Relaxation therapy, which I talked about, and sleep hygiene, which I covered in the in the previous slide. All right, next slide. I just want to say that you know uh, these are great resources and can be used for ourselves as well. And there's a lot in the VA and the Veterans Affairs as well, including manuals and worksheets uh, to kind of look at little tips. So again, if you're in the midst of care and and having disruptions in sleep. This is something to kind of just take a look at to kind of refresh things you may already know, but things that are helpful just to review um, and attend to our own self-care. All right, next slide. So I'm gonna talk about nutrition challenges as well, because I think, again, basic needs. Uh, one of the challenges during our time right now in our current context is, you know, food, whether it's, you know, not gathering with people that we uh, spend time with or cooking for one another, uh, can be a challenge or the isolation, grocery stores as well. Um, uh, I think those are some challenges. The increased workload, so less time, so eating meals more sporadically, maybe less energy to kind of think about meals. Uh, social isolation, again, if, if meal time is a time of gathering and socializing, now that might be changed. 
and stress and just feeling the stress and pressures of the environment around us can definitely have impact on us. And so although there's Canada's food guide, those things are difficult to implement in our, in our current setting. So really appreciating that and thinking about what strategies we might be able to use. Uh, next slide. Um, so this is just a model of stress and how stress affects our brain and brain and, and kind of uh, gut are closely linked. Um, I will say kind of eating, um, management of uh, kind of weight is more and more thought of as being a, a brain disorder. And we know that stress has uh, numerous impacts on parts of our, our brain related to homeostasis and our hypothalamus, but also our mesolimbic and reward symptoms, lots of um, uh, research on various pathways. And it affects how we kind of use energy, but also our food intake and appetite affected by um, definitely neuroendocrine um, uh, uh, signals, including uh, things from our GI tract and infecting our kind of brain receptors like leptin and ghrelin, but also cortisol, for example, in more uh, chronic conditions. So again, important to know that stress is very, um, very uh, linked to both our brain and mental health, but also to our physical health and some of our hunger and needs. Uh, next slide. Uh, I just uh, was sent this by uh, the dietitians I mentioned. They, they uh, really uh, kind of shared this with me. Um, I'm blanking on her name, but I'm going to try to find it to dig it out for me. But I think her name is, it's Abby Sharp, and who's a dietitian. I thought it's a useful kind of eight, I think it's eight or nine minutes clip on, uh, you know, concerns about grocery shopping, takeout food, and kind of hygiene um, and safety amidst COVID, very practical, um, aligned with many of the public health recommendations. So again, for myself, I've, I've been kind of using it with uh, friends or family that need uh, had questions, but, uh, but also for ourselves, kind of if you want some extra resources, it's a great one as well, uh, available on YouTube. Next slide. Um, so just for meal planning, again, things to do, uh, again, at this time, uh, we're often kind of like scanning our kitchens, limiting our times to go to the grocery store, kind of no more than once per week, um, uh, going at off hours um, and uh, meal planning for the week or longer. So really thinking about that long term. So it's not things we, we may or may not tend to do. I definitely these are things I don't do usually in terms of uh, the frequency or the planning component in as much detail. So things to keep in mind. And then the next slide, um, meal preparation, again, thinking about using the foods that you have, uh, pre-meal, so freezing food or batch cooking is important, uh, using frozen fruits and vegetables. I, I was saying, you know, for me, I, I'm, I have my own personal habit of kind of uh, uh, often moving between sites, so I'm often trying to get food on the go. It's a lot harder now, uh, given that things are closed and we're, uh, kind of uh, physically distancing ourselves. So thinking about how to plan for that and what things to plan at home. Um, again, thinking about our self-care and time with family, maybe meal times a time to be uh, as, a, as a, a family fun time. And again, making sure that we're still having access to those indulgent foods to have enough of our reward pathways uh, kind of sensitized during this time, all right? We all need a treat. And so the next slide, uh, Javid. So again, I just thinking about these are all consistent with Canada's food guide, but really ways in which we can implement that. I know people are having Zoom dinner parties as well. And so that's another way to have meals with others virtually uh, and enjoying your food, uh, but also spending time together uh, during those meal prep opportunities. All right, next slide. And so just another approach that if you're at work, you're in the hospital, um, uh, there's a lot going on that sometimes having that meal time um, might be a mindful moment. And I just put this up here. This is from uh, kind of uh, uh, work that uh, one of the psychologists I work with has kind of her, her 10 tips about taking the time to actually uh, pause um, and have a meal, pause before eating to just to have that moment or that mindful moment, slow down and notice. And many of you know, if you've taken mindfulness or taught mindfulness before, the raise and exercise of kind of slowing down and noticing and, and being present in the moment, that practicing mindfulness at, while we're eating is also 
you know, something that requires patience and persistence and being open to what Ever and, and Heather illustrated that uh, today in her mindfulness exercise and letting go of those negative thoughts or feelings, really focusing on one thing and combine your inner wisdom with your outer wisdom in terms of, yes, you know what, you know, food to eat, the meals, et cetera, and, um, but really um, experiencing um, more of the inner wisdom of kind of your experience, uh, really valuing the quality and uh, really thinking about your triggers for mindless eating, whether it's stress or emotional and taking note of that. And, and that can be an opportunity to further um, utilize any relaxation techniques, uh, coping or seeking support. All right, next slide. So I do have a case. And I'm gonna uh, read out the case and then maybe pause there for uh, questions and comments. Um, but this is a case of Jerry, who's an RN, who's working on internal medicine floor in a hospital. Uh, had an increase in COVID positive cases the last week. Um, sorry, it should be that there's a typo there, but um, uh, due to uh, colleagues at home, due to self-isolation, he has increased his shifts. Um, and, and Jerry's partner works full-time at Loblaws, an essential worker. He's got a mother at home, 66 years old, and three children. Um, and sleep has been a major issue for Jerry the past week, trouble staying asleep, despite feeling exhausted, it's starting to affect his, his focus at work a bit, um, and he's a bit worried about ongoing kind of sleep difficulties. Next slide. Just a little more about Jerry as well. Um, oh, next slide, sorry, there. Oh, there we go, a little sensitive. Um, he's had some anxiety briefly as a nursing student in the past, but doing well, prior, uh, you know, up until now, uh, work, working in healthcare, uh, Jerry provides the updates and information on COVID developments within his family, so often the one that's the source of information and seeking information. Started melatonin yesterday, but not seeing much benefit, and noticed some weight gain as well, because he's been a bit sporadic with his meal choices, which have not been great as of yet, uh, given uh, workload and, and the current environment. So, um, what are some questions that you have about to clarify about kind of Jerry's situation, kind of challenges? What things would you rec recommend for Jerry as, as possible ways to start uh, addressing that? So we can start off with clarifying questions. I, I use a fictional case, but I, I think that's something for sure uh, for all of us as well in terms of um, as, as uh, things change and we're in our word context that it, it uh, normalizing that it's and knowing what to expect uh, can be helpful and then what kind of strategies and all the ones you talked about in terms of um, uh, some of the approaches I'm also seeing reading as I as I uh, summarize here um, create a structured schedule and some to prioritize exercise and even for shorter periods of time any counseling resources or outlets for him as well um, and a lot of people in Ontario are providing that as well. Um, uh, no news feeds in the evening is another one. Jigsaw puzzles. So again, uh, thinking about distraction or pleasurable activities that can kind of take our minds away from uh, those stressful things. Uh, I know uh, Heather uh, made a comment in our last echo this today about kind of news feeds. I don't know if you want to share that as well, Heather. Well, I was saying that based on our session on Wednesday, when Allison was talking about this fear that we can have on missing information that I have much like different wellness behaviors that I'm trying to be really deliberate about these days um, is being deliberate about my sources of information. And I've actually chosen to use this group and um, Mona's update specifically around COVID-19 that sort of curate around specific um, questions that this group has as one of my kind of non-sensationalistic, neutral news sources, so. Yeah. And I'm, I'm giving a shout out to Dr. Mona. <laughs> Great. I'll open it up for the other Hub members if they want to make any comments as well, or other spokes as well, because we've had some great feedback here. I'm trying to keep up with the chat as well, so Javid, if I missed anything. I think we got all the, the main um, recommendations, and actually I think there's the segue from Heather's perfect actually for taking us to the next spot. Um, and actually is the information that, um, unless you want to finish anything in the case, we'll move on to the next one. 
Yeah, I, I think my last few slides were a summary and, and more of the references. So I don't think we need to put the slides back on, but uh, just those will be available for you as well. And someone asked about CBTI and I put the link there for the manual for the uh, Veterans Affairs website as well. Uh, useful for ourselves, useful for anyone else that's experiencing kind of sleep difficulties as well.